This morning, we have the first in a series of three conference calls designed to share information on topics relevant to after-school service providers. The format for this call is that we will have a guest presenter speak to the topic, a follow-up shorter presentation from a second presenter, and then an opportunity for you to ask questions about the presentation or the topic. This morning's topic is staff training and helpful hints, and we'll be covering staff hiring, staff meetings, staff training, and staff evaluations. A lot to do in a little time. But at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Liz McGrath, who will be presenting information about staff training in after-school programs. Liz is the coordinator of the after-school programs for the National Capital Region, YMCA, YWCA in Ottawa. Liz, we're delighted to have you. And if you could please begin your... I'm going to start off uh, with our first slide, uh, which uh, the topic is staff hiring procedures. And uh, we've all uh, gone through that uh, during the summer and September with hiring new staff for our after-school programs. So I know what we do is start off with uh, getting a job posting out there that is based on our uh, site supervisor job description that you can see is one of the resources on the right hand side along with program leader uh, job description. So in our hiring we hire one more mature staff who has some experience or training in child and youth uh, background in recreation or it could be a teacher or someone that uh, has some experience in, in some to some degree. So we post the jobs and there's a number of different ways that we do that on our Y website, uh, Community 211 Service Canada to local universities and colleges which include Ottawa U and Carleton University and Algonquin College. Uh, we also have a local employers networking group where uh, we're connected so we pass on uh, various job postings to different employment service agencies including our own, the Y has its own employment to agency. So what we do uh, to start with is uh, invite people to come in for an interview and we, as part of that interview, we invite them to participate in a volunteer session. So that's part of the interview process that we have. And uh, at the interview, we'll, uh, we have a whole list of questions that relate to, uh, of course, to their experience and their goals in, in the field. and. Uh, the other part of it is to use that interview as a, a means of educating them uh, to the why in our background, our mission and values, and our uh, curriculum that we use. It's a physical activity curriculum and nutrition education uh, curriculum, our policies and procedures that we follow in the after school program. So we have a, a before and after school program uh, parent handbook, so you can see that in the resources to your right as well. And we also give them information about the specific program that they're being interviewed for. We have before and after school programs. We have 17 of them. So it really depends on uh, where your need is at the time because we have half of our uh, program supervisors and many of our program leaders returned. And I do those phone calls during the summer to find out who is returning and who isn't. And with about 500 children in the after school programs, that means uh, we have about uh, 60 staff and then there are a number of volunteers who also return in the uh, September time frame. So I make those phone calls and in the meantime when we're interviewing I might give them a newsletter from a specific program. So you can see as one of the resources on the right as well is a newsletter um, from one of our programs, Our Lady of Fatima newsletter. So in the first newsletter that we put out during the year we introduce the staff, we have an outline of what the program involves, what kinds of activities and ours are recreational of course and physical activity is, is the main thing so we also educate uh, the person that's being interviewed about our Catch Kids program, which stands for Coordinated Approach to Children's Health, so that half of the program time they're doing physical activity and we're also delivering uh, nutrition lessons uh, during the program. So we talk to them about their knowledge in those areas and uh, that's part of the interview. And then we send them out to a volunteer session. So of course during the summer we don't, uh, we don't have um, after school programs going on, but we do have summer camp and our licensed child care, so we'll have them participate for uh, a couple of hours. Uh, they'll come in and we observe their comfort level and their skill level uh, working with children in that age group of 6 to 12 year olds. And that's part of the uh, interview, as I said. So 
even if we don't hire them, we do encourage them to join us as a team uh, in our programs as a volunteer. So if they're not successful in obtaining a position, uh, then that's the other way that they can gain some skills because we invite all of our volunteers uh, to do the trainings and things like that that uh, the staff uh, are expected to uh, participate in. So when we schedule the interview, we request that they do this volunteer session, and uh, it, it certainly does give us a, a good idea of what, uh, what their skill level is and if they're really uh, motivated uh, to work with children. So we do, as I said, uh, hire someone who's more mature at each site uh, to work with the children, and then other staff who are very motivated. They may not have a lot of experience, uh, but they're very motivated, and they may be that, you know, that 15 to 18-year-old who's in high school or just starting high school. They're uh, looking to get community hours, so that's a whole other area of the interview uh, that we have. So I have two specific interviews that I do as well uh, and add more questions to someone that we're really targeting as a supervisor who will be in charge on site at that program. And uh, the other staff, of course, uh, we, we ask them similar questions uh, but are, are looking at them uh, in a different light. So if we move on to the next slide uh, about staff meetings, one of the important things that we start with uh, with our supervisors is inviting them, uh, and you'll see at the last point in this slide, is the August meeting, and I'll come back to that later. But what we encourage all of our teams to do is organize formal team meetings, so once a month uh, that they're doing something like that, that they're inviting everyone. Uh, some of the programs have... 20 students in one of our largest programs, we have 120. So you're going to have a supervisor and 12 staff in one of the programs and a supervisor and one other staff in another program. So these team meetings we feel are very important. It's a time for them to get to know one another, do icebreaker activities, uh, also go over topics that have come up uh, over time and that they, they may need some help with. They uh, the supervisors would call me as the coordinator uh, to help with some of the uh, information that they might need or support that they would need. On site, we have different um, tools of communication that we use uh, to make sure that we're informing the staff at all times. In the larger programs, as you can appreciate, they're coming in from school or from another job, uh, jumping into the after-school program, so they have to have a way of knowing what's going on. So some of the tools that we use are uh, weekly and monthly program plans. So the staff might come in, take a look at, okay, this week this is what we're doing, these, these are the program ideas, and this is what my responsibilities are this week. And for the whole month it will have theme-based or activity-based uh, programming. They know what, what's going on. Now presumably they'll be having a quick uh, meeting at the end of the day on Thursday or Friday the week before, so we encourage all the staff to meet five or ten minutes at the end of every day if possible, but especially at the end of the week to make sure that they're aware of what their responsibilities are going to be the following week. So we want to have all of these things posted in the program. And a communication book is one of the formal things that we do use as a tool to communicate. Uh, the supervisor will write down things that she takes note of during the day, that um, there might be some information about a child that uh, needs to be updated or uh, that they need to, we need to pass on to the staff so that they can check the next day when they come in and they're aware a certain child in their group is leaving early that day or there's someone else picking them up that we need permission for. And uh, so these kinds of things are ongoing, so communication is the thing that I know we all focus on in our programs. So the other, uh, some other things that we would, uh, we would do is uh, uh, record any strategies or plans that we would have to improve the relationships and programming. Uh, as I said, recording any pertinent information about a child or the program routine for the day or the week and that we would want to post duties. In some of our larger programs, the cleaning responsibilities are really a critical thing, so even those responsibilities are everyone takes turns, including the supervisor, uh, to do the cleaning and organizing uh, in the program. Now, one thing I would like to uh, 
point out is that we also get together once a month as supervisor and coordinator. All of the supervisors, we have 17 of them in our after-school programs in the National Capital Region, YMCA, YWCA. We meet here at our downtown office at 180 Argyle Street, and we have programs that go from the West End in Canada out to the East End in Orleans, so it's quite a large geographic area. But we do make time once a month to have a formal two-hour meeting where we do program updates as well as uh, talking about anything, anything challenging that we've experienced, and we also use that time uh, to, to implement a workshop. So we might invite a guest to come in who can talk to us about uh, inclusion as one of, uh, as an example, or active supervision. Anything that we've identified. I know I've used uh, excerpts from our. Uh, uh, why Healthy Child Development on Bullying, also the High Five training that I've received from Parks and Recreation, I've used uh, that part on bullying. So we've, we've pulled out topics that we've needed to support our programs when we've identified uh, things that uh, have happened. So that's that's been a, a benefit. The August meeting is a really important meeting that uh, I have with supervisors as the coordinator. I invite all of our new supervisors who are and returning supervisors to a meeting about the third week in August. I hope to have all of the, our staffing uh, in place. So the August meeting is a place where, and I don't know if you can pull up any of these uh, uh, documents, you can upload them, and as Marion said, uh, don't worry about them right now, but later you'll be able to upload the file and save them to your computer, so that's what you would be doing. Uh, in our August meeting, we meet, uh, we do some icebreakers, we get to know one another, uh, so I have in that agenda a couple of activities that you could use as an icebreaker. So we go through that, get to know one another, talk about our programs. I bring up newsletters, our September newsletters, for all of the supervisors to see and to look at and to read through, look at what the programming was planned for in the previous year, which doesn't necessarily mean you're going to use the same program plan because the numbers of children, the ages of children can change. And we do encourage the supervisors and their team uh, to take a look at what that program is and the outline and the structure, and they may have to change it after a couple of weeks. Uh, the first week and the first day is going to look different than what that program outline is saying. So we use that August meeting to discuss that and to encourage the supervisors when they uh, leave the meeting to contact all of their program leaders who are going to be working with them on site, get uh, a meeting organized, and to talk about what the first day is going to be like and that focus on safety and supervision as well as the games and activities that they're going to implement. But that first week is going to be very different as we all know from the way the programs evolve and, uh, and, and get into place as we establish routines in the programs. So that August meeting is, is really critical. We give out uh, program binders with all of the registration forms, emergency backup cards, uh, health and safety information that they'll need uh, for every child. All of the documents that you see here, if they don't already have them, uh, we'll have original copies for them in that program binder. Uh, and. Uh, I guess for the August meeting, that's really that's everything that uh, we cover. The next thing on training, and we discuss this in our August meeting, we discuss the dates of trainings that are going to be happening. And the first thing that we talk about is uh, reviewing the training manual that every new candidate and person that was interviewed and hired would have a copy by email because I send them all out to every prospective staff or volunteer. They get a copy of that training manual, the parent handbook on policies and procedures, the curriculum document, uh, which is our Catch Kids program, uh, uh, physical activity and nutrition education. And all of that program is outlined in that newsletter that you have access access to. And there's also a CATCH website. I give them uh, that information, so it's www.catch.org. And when you get into that, catchinfo.org, I'm sorry, and when you get into that website, there is a link to Canada, so you can see the kinds of things that are going on in Canada. I point that out to them, that that's a really important thing, but we all will receive training, uh, including volunteers, in our CATCH Kids training, so that's one of the first trainings 
that we have. It's a full day of training in physical activities, so we play games, we talk about the philosophy of CATCH and discuss how we're going to implement it into the program. Uh, we give the staff some a child guidance uh, practices, how to uh, guide the children's behavior in that program as well, and there's the practical information in the training manual. And the uh, we discuss the job descriptions of the staff and bring all of uh, those into uh, into focus at the first staff meeting that the supervisors have. And the second training is our Why Healthy Child Development. So it's similar to uh, the High Five training with the focus on three principles of healthy child development. And there we can bring in a lot of different topics uh, into play, but it's basically understanding the ages and stages of children who are 6 to 12 years of age. So we do that in September. Uh, we encourage all of the staff to uh, look at the trainings that are offered from the After School Collaborative, uh, sharing in other trainings that are offered. And recently, uh, we've had the Play It Fair uh, organization, Equitas, which is uh, the an organization promoting children's human rights and its values-based training similar to what the Y provides and so we encourage them and pass information on to all of the staff about those trainings and we ask staff uh, to have bi-monthly meetings with their staff at a at a minimum once a month uh, but as I was saying earlier taking five or ten minutes at the end of uh, the programs each day to catch up on information is helpful. And finally, staff evaluation. Uh, the meetings themselves uh, are times to talk about what goals you have in programming, but we recommend that at least twice a month, uh, at a minimum again of once a month, that you're having one-on-one -on -one meetings with your staff in your programs to talk about uh, all the great things that they're accomplishing, but setting goals for them as well. And we call these CEDOS sessions, so that stands for Continuous Development of Skills. And I received this uh, information through a workshop given by Michael Brandwin, who has over 25 years of experience working with uh, young people in leadership roles and uh, staff training is his area of uh, uh, training and uh, he has some wonderful trainings that are very entertaining, informative, very practical and we do have uh, a, a link to his website. I think if you just go on michaelbrandwin.com you will come to uh, his website and there's an area that you can click on a uh, free training there but he does uh, give some practical advice and tools on how to develop your staff skills. and. Then finally, it's the after school staff evaluation tool, which if I can ask uh, Jennifer to pull that up for us. It's a monitoring of behavior management practices. Now, there's something that I have to explain about our uh, YMCA, YWCA. We're going through some uh, changes in our logo and also some updates in some of our uh, tools that we use. And this is one of them, but it has some really great information within it. So we really should be titling that the monitoring of child guidance practices. So that's something that's a little more up to date and we'll be revamping this. So you're welcome to use some of this information and put it uh, you know, in with your own logos and uh, in your own way. But if we can go through uh, each of these points, it's a good thing to give to the staff at the very, be in the very first meeting you have. Give them a copy of this. And, and of course, in after school, we should be starting with September to December and you know, identifying it that way. So this actual tool needs some updates, but the information here is, is great. Uh, that uh, we have adopted so many of our practices from our licensed child care through our, our manager who has given us some great support in, in that area. When I came into the after school programs in 2008 as a child youth and family coordinator, transferring to after school programs only and coordinating and making everything more consistent, all of our policies and procedures, this is one of the things that um, that we've done to help staff. So at the very beginning, the staff will have a copy of this document. These are the things that are very specific things that they can focus on to see that they are doing these things during programming and we can be informing them. You know, every couple of weeks we can be talking to them about, oh, you're doing great in these areas and now here's a goal that you could work on for the next couple of weeks until we meet again. 
So the first one uh, provides constant supervision of all children and continuously scans the full environment. We have a, a workshop that we've done on active supervision, so that speaks to that, uh, that particular point in uh, a staff skill. Supervision of children, including setting and defining expectations for groups and individuals. Uses appropriate voice, tone, and language. Uh, provides positive feedback and reinforcements when appropriate. Responds to children in a positive, gentle man manner. Is able to guide inappropriate behavior in a firm, consistent manner. Is a good role model for children by providing good interactions with adults and children verbal and through body language establishes and maintains room control, encourages problem solving and decision making. Now up until this point, we see that all of these points are very positive in nature and you'll, you're going to kind of wonder well, why are we asking this next question or why are we putting it in this way. It says uses an authoritarian approach. Now this is where we could make some changes and say uses an authoritative approach. As, as we all know, there are three different approaches uh, to a discipline. Authoritarian would be the one that is very harsh. Uh, authoritative is the one that we would want to be aiming for and laissez-faire would be the one that we don't want to <laughs> want to be aiming for at all. So uh, I think the reason that there are th about three of these points that are put in where you would want to answer no for the staff, but it could be a, a discussion point, a point where you could discuss, well, what does authoritarian mean as opposed to authoritative or laissez-faire? And then we'll move on to the next one, uses passive words and avoids or ignores situations where discipline or redirection is required. So this is where you would want to say no here as well. But it does, it does uh, underline or illustrate a point if you want to keep that wording. Again, shows a genuine enjoyment for their teacher role and is seen as an extension of their play. So that's a positive way of putting things. Exercises patience, remains calm when directing behavior or relaying information repeatedly. The next point, conditional enjoyment of certain children and or situations. You would want that to be a no answer where you would want the your staff to be unconditionally enjoying all of the children and giving them equal and fair attention. The next point, children feel comfortable to approach with questions, concerns, or play invitations. Actions come across as natural and spontaneous, which creates a relaxed, enjoyable atmosphere. And finally, interactions are at the child's level, language as well as positioning. So these are some very specific things that you would want to observe the staff doing. They're observable and identifiable and something that you can, you can focus in on to talk to them about uh, when they're working with children, as well as running games. And we have other evaluation tools. Uh, the Catch Kids evaluation tool is one that you'll see on the checklist. You can upload that, take a closer look at that. That's specific to a program, uh, but you can see whether the staff are actually implementing the games in a cooperative, inclusive way. So uh, I, Jennifer, if you'd like to take the um, uh, the staff evaluation checklist away. Thank you. And uh, just take a closer look at the resources on the right. Uh, again, the CATCH evaluation, I'm just seeing if it's there. Yes, at the bottom, CATCH Kids Club Evaluation and Leader Interview Form. It's a great evaluation form for any cooperative games that you're running in, the, in the, your programs. Uh, CATCH Kids Club is a specific training with CATCH Kids Games. It's a kit with hundreds of games that are uh, cooperative games that identifies a skill that you're working towards and teaching the children. Uh, our kits are mainly the grade three to five kits, but there's a kindergarten kit and a kit for uh, the grade six to eight if you have programs for that age group. But it's the Catch Kids philosophy is a cooperative inclusive game. So as long as you're using any game, it can be a traditional game that you've adapted to that kind of approach, uh, this uh, evaluation form is a great form to use uh, to evaluate and use to discuss with the staff uh, about how they're implementing those games in the program. So our expectation is that half the program time the children are being physically active, but at least 30 minutes of that they're being, uh, you know, that moderate to vigorous physical activity is being implemented. So that's a great tool. We use a couple of other tools when we're doing program evaluations, but I won't get in, into that right now. But this is a great one for staff and share all of this with your staff and volunteers. The other thing I'd like to say about uh, the CEDO sessions when you're meeting with staff or if you're looking at uh, the things that Michael Brandwin um, recommends, it's always
always putting things in a positive way towards staff, always talking about all the great things they're doing and setting uh, areas where they need skill development as goals. And that's the one thing I really appreciate about uh, the uh, trainings that Michael Brandwin provides and the information I've got, uh, his manual on staff training. It's uh, you know training staff to be uh, uh, the best they can be. And it's training youth staff as well. So uh, in our programs, we have so many youth staff that it's, uh, it's a great uh, tool to focus on. That was wonderful information, uh, Liz. A, a, I think one of the best things is all of the resources that are on the side are wonderful. And uh, thank you so much for sharing those. I know that everyone will likely be, uh, uh, will be downloading them at the end of the presentation today. Um, and again, a reminder, if you have any questions on anything that, um, that Liz has presented or on anything relative to staff training, uh, please feel free to input them. And uh, we'll continue on right now, though, with Katie. Uh, Katie Bushy is the Style Program Manager with the Learning Disabilities Association in the Toronto District, as you can see on your website. And Katie, if you were there, the webinar is yours. Hi there, everybody. I just want to say, Liz, thank you so much for your presentation. It's glad to see that us here at Learning Disabilities, as well as everyone else um, tuning in, we all seem to have the, the same best practices. So that's wonderful and amazing. And thank you for going over those with you. So um, as Marion did mention, my name is Katie Bushy. I am the program manager for the style program here at the Learning Disability Association Toronto. Um, we run a program um, that services youth between the ages of 13 to 18. So we are within the youth focus, and we run an after-school program based within priority neighborhood high schools across Toronto. Um, so basically, my understanding is my couple of minutes here that I have to chat is to focus on some helpful tips that help us when we're working with youth when it comes to staff training. And um, we here at the Learning Disabilities Association Toronto, and more specifically within the STYLE program, approach it from a holistic point of view. And we bring our youth into the conversation, and we make the youth stakeholders. Now, obviously, youth as stakeholders look much different than adults as stakeholders. But we invite the youth into the conversations of how would you like your staff team that's going to be working with you during the after school hours to look like. And we bring that into um, the conversation when we're training staff as well as we go into our communities and we learn about our communities. And uh, we learn about the adult culture in the communities within the high schools, as well as the youth culture and the peer-to-peer -peer culture. And we find staff that are able to relate into that, but still keep that staff um, role within our program. So as well, when it comes to training, because I know that's something we're touching on here, is um, staff co-lead their staff training. So w many of us have staff dollars that we can spend to bring in you know, trainers, to bring in you know, specialists in that. We ask our staff on a monthly basis, if you had a training date and you needed to give up a Saturday, what would you want to be trained on? Or what's real intangible within your program sites right now that we as your administrators or we as a collective group can work together to get you training. And obviously, the conversation opens up into lots of great stuff. And it moves the staff forward, because they really see that um, they're being heard and that they're getting training that's more specific for their program site. So, and you know, we do small things here. We remember birthdays. We remember weddings. We do kind of, you know, simple, but the, the more human aspect, the more human connection um, away from, you know, what Liz talked about, you know, obviously having direct training, obviously having, um, you know, the outline and what's expected and the requirements and the education in that. So, and, and that's pretty much it. Just a couple of helpful tips that we use here. We do have a 95% staff retain retention over here in our program, and we've been running for five years. And um, it's something that's working really well. We use it over in our volunteer-led driven programs um, that also service four other schools across Toronto, and, and we find that it's a model that works. So. I welcome questions and uh, comments about that. So with Marion back, thank you very much, Katie. That was a lot of information in a relatively short period of time, so uh, that's wonderful. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, so um, if, uh, Liz, you could unmute your line too. Uh, then the first question is actually more geared to uh, Liz in terms of, because Katie, you just mentioned you have a, a relatively high retention rate of 95% with your staff, which is great. So Liz, how often does your staff turn over in kind of the year? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a part one question. And then the part two of it would be, 
Um, how do you deal with new uh, with training new staff that join your team throughout the year? Well, I, I would say it's about 50-50. I'd have to look at it more closely. But since starting in 2008, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate. We've had many of our supervisors remain. Uh, so not as many supervisors have gone, but it seems to be a, a as I'm looking at it, maybe a three-year cycle because many of our supervisors, are their goals are to be a teacher, so they're in university. That's one of our requirements that, that we hope they have had some training. So they, they're either in university college or they've just graduated, so they're just out of teacher's college. They seem to be staying with us right now. The job situation and market in Ottawa for teachers is it's not easy to get on the supply list. So I'm having more and more teachers who are, they want to be in the school environment where most of our programs are, and they're wonderful, and as well as child and youth workers. Uh, but I would say 50-50, which is great. You know, that, that's wonderful. And, they've, and the ones that have stayed with us are, you know, they've been here now three years that I'm, I'm seeing right now, but that could change because this is a part-time position that we offer them. And uh, if someone comes on uh, in the middle of the year, I've had a couple of supervisors say, you know, I'm, I'm, my program is changing, so now I won't be able to commit five days a week. And that's one thing we ask is that they can commit the five days a week. Uh, sometimes we've made some exceptions on a day where they have to leave early or, you know, we've got a strong staff there that can fill in for them. So we are looking. It seems like January there's a, a bit of a turnover, so we provide the training again in January. And I'll do one-on-one -on -one or I'll go into the program and have a, a, a team meeting and, and we can go over things that way. But we do uh, do the Catch Kids and Why Healthy Child Development again in January. So I do it at least twice a year. And if I have to, it'll be that one-on-one -on -one meeting where I give them all the resources and I'll go in. And I do program evaluations so I can help them at that time. So I'm constantly doing program evaluations. And I can give them su support then when I'm visiting the programs. That's really helpful to know. Yeah, and uh, because one of the things that the Ontario After, After School Collaborative has been uh, receiving information on is that the transition of staff is is somewhat one of the most sometimes yeah. one of the most challenging pieces. Yeah, the uh, program leaders, yeah. yeah, younger staff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So another question, and this would be uh, for both of you, it looks like that has come up is. Uh, you were mentioning in terms of, uh, Katie, in terms of the staff training, uh, if people wanted to take a training on the weekend on a Saturday as an example, what kinds of things would they uh, want to be uh, trained in? What would they want to learn about? So um, I'll ask Katie you first and then Liz. Um, what, uh, do you require staff to attend staff training? Are they paid to do it? Are they, um, uh, is it uh, an option for them to do it on their own time? Um, when you're talking about the weekends. If you could just uh, reflect on that for us for a moment. Thanks, Marion. Um, yes, so our staff are required to, attain, uh, to attend our training. Um, we do sometimes in the first three months of September, October, November, do have monthly trainings to get everyone back into the flow. We do also have summers off, so we're getting everyone into the flow, and they do need to attend. It is a paid training um, and our training is very specific because we're working with youth that have learning disabilities so ADHD, um, dyslexia, dysgraphia so we're dealing with a very niche group of youth that we work with so our programming and our training is very specific so it is mandatory um, and then you know as we get into the winter months we have a winter shakeup where we bring the staff team together uh, frontline team administrative team all of our volunteers together it, it is an invite they do not necessarily have to attend but that's when they can come and they can really hash out what's going on in program and they can really bring up what their concerns are and it's from that think tank that we have or that winter shakeup as I call it in January February that sets the stage for what the training will look like heading into the, the coming months and this is Liz here. I, uh, the the trainings are paid, so the they are mandatory. The catch kids and the why healthy child development, uh, but that that's an area I struggle with a little bit is getting staff that have already had the training. Uh, because our trainings with with uh, you know 50 or 60 staff, it's usually the new staff that are trained in. September and January, it's giving the, 
you know, the booster sessions, we call them, to staff that have been with us for a while. So that's why I focused on through the site supervisors, if there are topics that they've been able to, you know, glean from their staff and, and doing a workshop, you know, for the supervisors and then to take it back, you know, to their team meetings. And I can come in as I've offered to come in and do, you know, a team meeting with some of them where we identify in each of the 17 programs where they might need some extra support. But we do pay the staff and I would try to, we would pay them for the extra hour if I came into their programs to do that. Uh, but there are other times we invite our volunteers to come, of course. They're uh, open to come to any of our trainings. Um, I would love to be doing more, and I, I really appreciate what the After School Collaborative is doing. I know some of our staff are on here today, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and both of you have mentioned that uh, that you offer the opportunity for your staff, uh, supervisors or otherwise, to identify what the kinds of trainings that they want to take are. Liz, can you tell us what the the top kind of couple of trainings that people are asking for? I would say, well, active supervision is is one of them. Uh, Hmm. I think we've covered things pretty well. It's a little early right now. I know I was at a program last night, and it, it certainly is that, uh, you know, training younger staff to have uh, that view, that big picture view, and not get so focused. So it's that reminder. It's the role of the supervisor who is more mature to be, you know, guiding the staff to, you know, cleaning up afterwards. And so it's active and actively supervising the children for safety. Uh, that's the one thing I, I'm hearing. Inclusiveness is very, you know, it's something that we really promote and encourage. And so, you know, some of the challenges they have there, that would be, uh, you know, would be helpful to have more strategies, which we did. We had the Learning Disabilities Association of Ottawa come in and do a training with our supervisors. It's then how to get it out to all of our staff, like getting everyone together at the same time to do a training is, is uh, difficult and we don't have the funds for to do as many as I would like to do. Okay, that's great. And Katie, from your perspective? Um, we've seen staff training on programming. So how do I program for at-risk and hard-to-engage youth? So we've done programming and we've done training around that. Behavior management, self-mentorship, self-care, um, and also being able to translate um, their current tools that they have now maybe working in not such an after-school background or a community background and how to translate those skills into an after-school program. Okay, that's helpful. And uh, I believe we have some more questions. Uh, Jennifer, are you on the line now? Maybe not, but I have a question from Jenny. Um, Jenny is asking, what motivates uh, people to return to a part-time job uh, uh, with, uh, with not much room to get a promotion or maybe a raise? Hmm, good question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, let's, uh, let's ask uh, Liz this first. Well, in many, many instances, it's gaining experience working with children. They've already had camp experience as, you know, they've, as they've grown up as being teenagers and now they're at university and they're, you know, maybe in their second year of university. That seems to be second or third year and they want to go to teacher's college or they want to take that child and youth worker diploma or the recreation management or they're in those programs and they, they want to work with children. They love working with children. So they, they may be with us two or three years. It's the teachers that I'm seeing right now staying with us uh, because our programs as I said are in school so the children go from their classrooms to the gym and uh, we've got a, quite a number of teachers who've got their degrees but they can't get work so they're just waiting they're gaining more experience they love working with the children and they love our program I had uh, one of our staff who is with us now for her second year and she's not on the supply list here in Ottawa and she said to me you know I came into this trying to run the after school program like a classroom and she said I really realized I, I really thank you for the recreational training and catch kids and you know what you've been doing because it really is the appropriate program to have physical activity and all of these things for children after school. Uh, we've got, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but high school students, their goals are to work with children. So there, there's a lot of, but to stay motivated, it's that desire to eventually have full-time work with children and to gain the experience. And Katie, from your perspective, with a 95% return rate, um, mm -hmm. what's, uh, what's the attractor factor that, uh, that you have going there? 
completely agree with Liz. She completely summed it right up. It's, it's loving the program that you're in. It's wanting the experience. It's having the passion of working with children and youth and being there. We do see a lot of teachers who, unfortunately, are so qualified, but there's just not room within the board at the moment for them to attain a position. So we're seeing a lot of them that are coming on board. But we are also seeing that some of our teachers that are successful are coming back to our program uh, because they are so committed and, and want to say thank you for taking a chance on me when maybe I, I didn't have the opportunity anywhere else. And we get a feedback from our staff team that it's a very family-oriented feel that we have here within the style program that this, you know, the management, myself as well as my program coordinator, as well as the ED, are extremely approachable. They feel that they're extremely supported. Um, we always keep them in the loop if there's, you know, advancements if there's possible with, you know, new funding opportunities in that. So um, it, it, we have a very human feel, as I've mentioned before, um, and they love the youth. And they say that there's no possible way that, you know, um, that they could not go to program and see the youth. I've had volunteers who have turned down paid positions within style because they can't possibly imagine getting paid to do what we do here because they love it so much. And I think that's a very interesting uh, comment because many times uh, organizations will say 40 hours of community service for a high school student, we, t we spend more time training them than they actually are in the program. And yet when you create that kind of stickiness, that kind of relationship building with the young people, those organizations that do that tend to find that those young people stay longer with them because they have an affinity to those relationships and, and the feeling that they get of of empowerment and engagement and uh, meaningful participation in what they're doing. So that's a, that's a wonderful approach. Uh, Katie, I have a question from uh, Tony who wants to know what STYLE stands for. Thank you, Tony, for asking that. Uh, STYLE stands for Skills Training for Youth Through Learning and Education. Great, thanks. Um, I just want to uh, thank Liz and Katie for your very informative presentations and your answering of the questions. Um, that's really helped uh, to contribute to the richness of this presentation. And uh, I know that we can't, oh, we could hear. Now we've unmuted everyone. We could actually have a little applause here. We've, we've, there we go. Yep, little applause. Yay, yay. <laughs>